The theme for Brother Mark's talks this weekend is the God of all comfort. The first class is entitled Comfort in Sickness, Recovery in the Kingdom. Brother Mark. Well, good afternoon, beloved brothers and sisters in Christ. First, let me say how delightful it is for Sister Jean and I to be here this weekend among you. We've um, already rekindled some old relationships that uh, have had faded somewhat into the past. And when we have the opportunity to come so far away and visit Christadelphians who are all waiting in these desperate times for the second coming of Christ together, um, the fellowship, the affinities that we have, the feeling of having known someone all their life when you've met them uh, just a few minutes, uh, those things are the richest part of life for us. So we, let me assure you, we are very, very glad to be here on a personal level. But before we get into, our, into the substance of our subject today, first things first. You will see a picture up here of my grandson. That's what I mean by first things first. If you're a grandparent, you know exactly what I mean. The um, preeminence they take in your affections is just over the top, isn't it? So this is Silas. And uh, I'm going to start on a lighter note because we're going to get into some very sobering and serious things. And I just think that this is probably the best way to start uh, this particular subject because it's, it's a caricature of what we experience in reality when we grow up and we get blindsided by things we never thought would enter our lives and they become severe trials uh, for little children, they have all the same feelings, but there's really nothing wrong. So this day, Silas and I had taken a walk down to the dock. It was a perfect day. Silas was on vacation. I had the day off. It was grandfather and grandson together. It's a sunny day. We're taking a walk. And I don't know, for some reason, the world as Silas knew it in that moment came to an end. And so... Um, he didn't want to finish the walk. We, we just got a few houses down and he stopped in this yard and he, he gets this look and he looks at him and he like freezes in his tracks and you can see his little fist is clenched and you can see the, the deep anxiety that is all across his face. Things just weren't going right for Silas that day and or in that moment especially and I had no idea why. There was no reason for him to feel bad. Uh, so I, we never did figure it out, but he had all the feelings of, uh, that are concomitant with total disaster, and he was in a very high state of dudgeon. So that's um, the innocence of youth, the way little children respond to the smallest of, of things. And when I was a little boy, this is me when I was about eight years old, um, I really wasn't asking why me. Uh, life was pretty good for me. This was the waterfront. I used to walk down there in bare feet and love to feel the warm sidewalk under my, uh, my feet and, and fish for gudgeons off the piers and crab. And I had a, a, a relatively perfect life. But I didn't know when I was this age what would happen to me when I got older. I didn't know. So the question had not come up yet, but it does for a lot of people. Some people at this age or earlier They've already begun to say, well, why me? Why did this happen to me? It's a very serious question when it's, it's accompanied by something that you never expected that appears in your context to be completely intolerable. But there's a deeper question still, and that is why. When everything goes wrong, when we suffer, when we can't explain it, uh, when it seems like God's justice has, has been left out of our circumstances, when you see other people who seem to be the beneficiaries of the love of God, or if they don't know God, they're beneficiaries of the goodness of human life, and for you, all that caved in somehow. It's, um, it's that question you, you ask when all seems to be lost, and that is at the heart of what we are going to consider all weekend as we look at uh, three specific examples and a fourth of people whose lives took a turn that 
they never expected and didn't seem to have any way out but bad. So that's the question why, and interestingly enough, as you know, those of you who have read your Bible and applied yourself to what you were reading, you know that the Bible addresses the question of why in advance. There isn't any question, I believe, that we can have that hasn't been somehow or another addressed. Even the one is that, that, that queries how come we don't understand this particular condition in the world. It has no explanation. It doesn't make sense, even though I know the truth now. There's, there are questions reserved for the day, and isn't the day the answer to those questions? That reservation, we know that, that one day, um, even though we can't understand what's happening now, there are, if not to us personally, to other people, or in the world, certain conditions, we know that those answers will be addressed and fully supplied in the kingdom. So the kingdom is the answer to all the questions that aren't answered right now. So is that not an answer to those questions? Everything has been dealt with by God's word. But this particular verse in uh, Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, where he says, he comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction. So there's the, the answer to the question, why? Why did this happen to me? Whether you were young or old, whether you're still in it or not, whether it's somebody you love or yourself or your children, your helpless children or your helpless elderly parents or those around you, whatever it is, if there's affliction, the answer to the question why is so that we who have the understanding of God's mind, his purpose, our reason for being, uh, the consequences of mortality and the consequences of the law of spirit of life operating in our lives so that we may be able to comfort those who are any, in any kind of affliction through the comfort we ourselves receive from God. That's the answer to the question, why or why me? So just a little background on what we will be addressing in this series. Um, it was six years in the making in some respects, uh, much longer than that in other respects. Uh, for example, when I said of me as a child, I didn't really know when life was good as a child what would happen to me when I got older. Um, when I was a newlywed and working very hard physically to sustain my marriage and uh, my firstborn child, um, I got a really severe back injury. And that back injury was to create pain in my life for the next 33 years. It's still residual in me, um, not quite as bad as it has been on occasion. It's up and down. But I've spent 33 years in chronic pain. And it's just my pain. I, I don't think it's as bad as maybe some other people's pain in the world. It's been bad enough to feel like it ruined a good portion of my life. If that weren't enough, and in the last 30 years, I had chronic headaches. And those headaches were so chronic and so pervasive in my life as to basically nullify and ruin 10 years of the last 30. So 30% of that time was ruined with headaches. And in all that, you know, I, I, I might have asked, why me? Uh, but for the fact that I was raised by two parents who told me about the kingdom from the time I was dandled on their knees. And so I had a very clear understanding that this, the things that we suffer from, even though they affect us deeply on a personal level, level are not really about us. The world at large is, is very old and, and full of, of suffering, groaning and travail together even until now. And that condition is the larger question that the mind of God addressed from the foundation of the world in the hope that he set before men. Uh, but the, the, uh, in the more local sense to the subject, the series was six years in the making because things came into our, conditions came into the lives of, in particular, three of the sisters in our ecclesia, which were so severe, and we, we got so deeply involved with that vicariously we went into their trouble and uh, they were three very distinct areas of suffering that, uh, on one hand, on the arranging board, 
we had to manage from that level. Um, as an elder in the ecclesia, I had to manage from that level, being the husband of my wife, who was a very nurturing sister uh, to these three sisters. I had contact with the suffering on that level. I was also very close to all three of them in different ways, very different ways. Um, and so in all of that, when, when you share the tears, you, um, you, you vicariously suffer from the pain, you ask all the questions that suffering people ask, you learn that the feeling most people have in, in such severe conditions is uh, one of isolation from the rest of the world where although in the abstract they know other people are suffering like they are, but their suffering is, they are isolated in their own suffering to such an extent that they feel all alone. And um, these are all very real feelings. We all know people who are going through them. I think some of you here have conditions in your lives that you are suffering from where you feel like you, you are suffering in silence alone where nobody really understands. And in most cases, um, how, how does anyone understand what, what everyone else around them uh, doesn't see. How, how, could, how could anyone understand how I felt for the last 33 years? How could I understand how you felt when you gone, have gone through your trials? So in that, the, the wonder, the majesty, the royalty, the um, depth and richness of the deliverance of God's plan for us, comes into such sharp focus in contrast to the affliction that we bear uh, that it takes its full meaning almost only as a contrasting promise to what we are forced to endure in the mortality and the frailty of, of our lives. And so uh, it was obvious to me, and these, these are the various subjects that we'll be, be speaking about between now and tomorrow morning, that when you are experiencing sickness of the kind that is really, really bad, um, the recovery of the kingdom is the most marvelous thing to dwell in. It's a place where you can go and stand on such wonderfully holy ground. Um, it, it doesn't take care of the problem, but it certainly is a, a way of managing the problem and when there is extreme loss loss of a loved one in from a death an, an untimely death um, the retrieval of that individual that that loved one that child as it is in this case in the kingdom um, becomes all the more real and you'll notice as we go through the the scriptures that are relevant to each of these different kinds of suffering that we'll be looking at that these scriptures on one hand, or something you might have read in the readings, uh, they might have meant something to you at one point in a talk, uh, or when you had a, a, some kind of, of realization somewhere driving down the road or in the middle of a prayer. But when you are in the depths of, of an extreme situation in its particulars, and then you look at the same verse again, the verse comes to life. And it, and it seems to somehow speak in a way it never did before. You see things. You see God was there all the while understanding what you would go through and addressing it in, 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 the, in the most intimate and, uh, and loving and kind and fatherly manner so that only a living God, only his living word could supply what is necessary to reach into your heart and address the things that your heart needs to understand. Only God's word and God's love from himself can do this for us. Where there's abuse, there's the idea of God's recompense. The day of judgment is not only there to decipher between those who followed Christ and those who didn't. It's there on a much larger level for God to deal with Satan. He's going to bind him but he's going to bind him after he judges him in good part when, when Christ begins his judgments in the world. And those judgments uh, will result in the slain of the Lord being from, strewn from one end of the earth to the other. So severe will his judgments be. So it's, it's uh, the goodness and severity of God is going to be known in that day in a way that it has never been known before. And when there's offense, we'll be speaking about offenses and judgments and grudges and 
criticisms and people who, who should love you and you should love being more like enemies than they are like brethren. Um, but the reconciliation that is promised in the future when we see breaches of all kinds, some kinds that make sense to us, some kinds that make no sense whatever, there are breaches that we experience as a community that in some respects are irrational and in other respects stand in defense of the truth. Resolving all these kinds of, of things now seems to be sometimes irreconcilable. But we know this, the reconciliation of the kingdom of God will put everything in its order and bring peace and happiness and joy in that reconciliation that exceeds even the joy of understanding the forgiveness that comes to us from the crucifixion of Jesus, wherein he took all our iniquities upon himself. That should put us in a very, very high state of joy. So that's that. But when he comes back and reconciles the whole world, And the starving are fed. And the sick are healed. And all these little children, these helpless little children are dancing in the streets. When that happens, that'll be reconciliation from a fence like we've never seen before. And then the restoration of the kingdom will deal with all affliction. So, working with these three sisters over three years of time... Um, it came to my mind that, 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 that there was a premise that formed when I was thinking of first doing this for a Bible school. I was thinking, okay, so I have an opportunity to share some ideas about our faith with uh, brothers and sisters at a Bible school. What will I talk about this time? And having gone through this, I thought, well, you know, I would prefer to talk about something I know a lot about. And what I knew a lot about at that moment was the suffering of these three sisters. So I, I realized that they were separate and distinct, three th distinct forms of suffering. And I also, having been with them, was able to recognize that what they were suffering from was not just isolated to them. There are way too many people in this world that suffer from the same thing. And that gave me the premise uh, for creating this series. And that premise is that there must be people in the last days, the dark days of this world right now, who are suffering in silence or suffering in open, in the open, in such a way that um, is as extreme or more extreme because of the, the hour, the late hour of this world's time, uh, more than, than ever before in history, although we know that human suffering has been consistent from the beginning. But the premise is that if what Paul said is true, that our suffering is meant for the comfort of others, if I could could describe their suffering to you and then put that suffering in the perspective of God's purview over us and his intimacy in our lives and his promise of redemption in the future, that those three sisters could, the, 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 a, a great assignment of meaning could be made to their suffering. So I went and asked them, I said, would you mind if I speak about what you've gone through? People. And they, they each gave me their permission in their own way. Uh, one of them needs to remain anonymous because of the intensity of her circumstances. But um, that is, is the, the, the basis of this. And you'll see what I mean when, when you take a close look at something which not only is just particular to that purpose, but also epitomizes an area of human suffering that needs to be addressed by our faith in the details of God's purpose. Uh, then they, they, these stories take on a vivid character that I don't think happens when we just speak about these things in the abstract. So this is our subject, and that is its environment. The subject is comfort, the environment is paradise. We don't live in it yet, but that is the environment of the comfort of God, that paradise which he has promised for the future. It's a big subject. If you look at the different kinds of word that words that are derived from the root comfort. You have comfortable, that means one thing. You have comforting, that's something else. It's all in the context of sufferings. You have the comforter who is promised uh, with the holy advent of the Holy Spirit and the, 
the change in roles that Jesus made from a suffering savior to a righteous everlasting high priest. Uh, you have discomfort and uh, uncomfortable at, on the negative side of the word comfort, but all using the same, the same root idea. I'd like to, to raise a question with you. There are two kinds of, of ways you can define comfort, natural and spirit. As I define them here, I've got both definitions up in front of you. See if you can, in your mind, find out what the distinction between the differentiation is between the two. The natural meaning, that is from a dictionary, is or of comfort is ease of grief, improvement of mood. So you're in a bad mood, you're comforted, your mood gets better. Uh, restoration of well-being. You, you were ill at ease or ill and comfort came along and your, your well-being was restored. That's the dictionary definition. The concordance definition is interesting because there's a differentiation, which may not be obvious at first, but when we talk about it, you will, you will see that it's a necessary distinction and one that come, can only be addressed in the context of faith. The spiritual meaning is to invite near, As if in prayer you invite God to be near to you, or if in prayer he invites you to be near to him. An appeal for consolation, or to entreat exhortation, or to pray. You see the difference? I pointed out to you. Spiritual comfort is not immediate relief. In the definition, in each case, what was the, the source of the discomfort is addressed, and comfort is the result. But the comfort in the concordance comes, to, to, comes from a direct nearness with God, an intimate understanding that exists between you and God in your faith, where something in his word has reached into your discomfort and addresses it, but does not relieve it. So you cannot say that spiritual comfort is immediate relief. It isn't any more than it was the immediate relief of Christ when he was facing his crucifixion. He was comforted. But it didn't take the, the cross away, did it? If you look at the stories of affliction and comfort in the Bible, immediate relief is not something that is, is uh, necessarily found. In fact, frequently not found in the sufferings. Instead, spiritual comfort is strength. Strength from hope. So the comfort is something that addresses our our disposition while we are suffering. This is a very important principle to understand as we, as we head into this subject. Paul, the, the, the theme came from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians in the, in the first chapter, in the first few verses there. He says this, after he made them um, sorrowful from his first letter. And he did that by saying, well, concerning your schisms, you got to do with this. Concerning the immoral man, you have to do this. Concerning um, our traditions and, and head coverings, you have to do this. And concerning the breaking of bread, well, I hear that you're doing this, but, but well, let's look at it this way. And one thing, point after another, he made them sorrowful. And he knew that he was. And he, and he said, I didn't want to make you uncomfortable. But he knew that the discomfort would bring uh, joy and comfort in the realizations and the understanding that he was going to provide in his descriptions of things. And so the second letter is starts with this, this overwhelming appeal to comfort, where having made them sorrowful, now he's going to see if he can make their comfort, his comfort to them clear. So he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. And if you read that, for what it says, it says that all comfort has to address all affliction doesn't it? If he's the God of all comfort, he has to, that comfort has to handle anything. Whatever comes up. It could be mental, it could be physical, it could be imposed on you, could be, you could impose it on yourself. Whatever it is, it could be just circumstances. Something, uh, like I said, that blindsides you and you, you never thought that would be your life and in, a, in a moment your whole life changes. If he's the God of all comfort, it has to address all affliction. So he goes on to say, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. That, again, is the reason for it. 
with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. If there's no comfort coming from God, then there's no real comfort coming in affliction except perhaps um, for the kind that, that mitigates you know, our suffering from the human touch or medicine or you know, a, little, a little brief respite from, from a horrible trial, whatever. But if it's comfort that comes from God, it is pervasive. It is able to handle every aspect of the suffering. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we're afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. So Paul's now thinking of his life and the things that happened to him. He'd go into a city, he'd go to a synagogue, they'd beat him up or he'd, he'd be shipwrecked, he'd be in standing water out in the ocean for, for a day and a night. And, um, and all these things were happening. He'd be, he'd be bitten by snakes and, and beaten with whips. So he's saying, well, if we're afflicted, it's for your comfort and salvation. So what we're going to talk about this, this weekend is how that works. If that's true, if, if it's by affliction that someone offers comfort to you, what exactly happens in that exchange? I mean, it doesn't happen in the same. He's just reminding them because he's going to go on to explain that in the whole depth of his letter. He says, if we are afflicted, it's for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it's for your comfort. So whether or not it came from affliction or for comfort, he's saying, whatever it comes to you from us, it's for your comfort. In other words, I love you. I could say this to you today. This is why I'm speaking about this subject, because I love you and I know you're suffering. And if you're not suffering personally, you will suffer. And if you haven't suffered yet, you know somebody who's suffering or you've been around somebody who's suffering. The suffering, there's, there's enough suffering in this world for us all to be intimately connected to it. And what Paul is trying to get across the Corinthian Ecclesia is, I, made, I know I made you sorry, but we have a mission of righteousness. We have a mission of, of reconciliation. And it's different from, from this mission of death that the law put on us all and made us miserable in the understanding of our sins. This mission is one of righteousness and joy and peace. And so when I come, however I come to you, I come to you with, with a tremendous amount of personal love for you. Whatever it was, if it's from my comfort or from my affliction, it's meant for your comfort. And that, that is the basis of this series. It is meant for your comfort and it will work in that regard once we start sharing the, the uh, particulars of the, the afflictions and the way faith works in their context. So he says, uh, when, which you, it is for your comfort which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. So there is this interesting statement of context. If you look at his message and you take everything out except his, his use of the word comfort, you can see this is his point. Whatever he says in the, in, the, in the second letter is meant to describe the fullness of what he's speaking about when he speaks about spiritual comfort. And it's in the context of affliction. You see how many times he speaks, he uses the word sufferings and affliction um, because the two are inexorably joined. We, we have the affliction and the comfort is an essential part of managing that affliction. So that's what we're going to look at how these three sisters managed their affliction. But I want to make this one point before we start looking at their, their particular circumstances. The time to respond to affliction is before it occurs. If you're young and you're kind of going, I know, yeah, well, okay, it's still abstract. You haven't really been through it yet. Maybe you have, I don't know, but you will. As a matter of fact, that's what the truth is for. Because the big question you should always ask yourself when you think, should I be, if you're not baptized, if you are, then you know what I'm saying, but you've already answered this question. But if you're not, the big question is, well, will the job I get, will this person I marry, that is the, my, the love of my life, will um, satisfying all my greatest interests in life, um, will becoming who I'm meant to be in this world with my talents and skills and my intellectual abilities, will that... Here's the question. Will that deliver me in the day of trouble? When the day, my day of calamity comes, will any of those things deliver me? Because what you want to secure in your youth 
is what will deliver you in the day of your calamity. And that's because there will be a day of calamity for every one of us. And if it isn't somewhere in the middle of life, interrupting life as we knew it, it will be at the end of life when a calamity, the calamity of our age weakens us to the point where we die in pain. Now, I didn't know this until I was with my mother in the last few days of her life. She, she lived in our home, and so we were with her constantly in her dying days. I didn't know how painful it was to die. It's not always painful. My father died suddenly, so he didn't experience that level of pain. But if you die the slow way, it's very painful. So what had my mother done, for example, to deal with her suffering before it occurred? To deal with the, the calamity of her age? She was 95 when she died. Very weak and very uncomfortable. What had my father done to deal with his calamity before it occurred? If you're young, if you're in your middle years, or even if you're getting on, advanced in your years, the thing that deals with with trouble before it occurs is what God's word puts into our hearts that provides the strength in time of need. This is why the psalmist said, in the multitude of my thoughts within me, thy comforts delight my soul. Those comforts come from thoughts. And unless you lose your mind, those thoughts will be present with you in whatever state that you find yourself in, in plenty or in want, in happy, the happiness of health or in the misery of, of tribulation. And then he also said, this is my comfort in my affliction, for thy word hath quickened me. How, does that, how can that word come in if it hasn't been already put there? So some people are able to, to manage the, the input during their suffering, but the best time to plant all those seeds, those seeds of strength and endurance and hope in your mind is before the suffering occurs. So now we're going to turn to this, the focus of this um, part of our series, sickness. And for that, we're going to look at the amazing heart of Sister Dawn Usack. She found the truth on her computer. She was always puzzled why religion made no, no sense, as most people are when they, when they are driven to the truth. Um, and the gratification that she experienced in understanding the truth was just unlike almost anything we had ever seen. And I, I, I've seen it from time to time. Um, there's an unspeakable emotion that overwhelms a person when they realize they were blind not just with their eyes but to the, to the future of the world to the sufferings of humanity they were totally blind until their eyes were open and they could see I've never been blind I don't know what it's like to have my eyes open physically but I know what it's like to see the future and that gives me a very special feeling inside. So this is, is Sister Dawn Usek, and I have to tell you a little bit about how this, this next series of pictures occurred. I, was, I wanted to talk about Dawn. I got her permission, and I called her up, and I said, Dawn, can I come take a picture of you? I don't think it would be right for me to tell your story without people seeing you. I mean, I have the slides. It's going to be in the middle of a presentation. I'd like to take a picture. So she said, sure, my life is an open book. Come on, take a picture. And you can show it in public. It's all right. So she dressed herself nicely that day and we went to see her. She lived across the Chesapeake Bay on Eastern Shore, uh, a couple hours from where we live. And when we went there, um, and she started to tell her story, because I was also going to record her story so that I could get certain parts of it, I noticed that she, I had my camera hanging on my, on my, the front of me here, and I noticed that her expressions were following her story. And this was completely unplanned, this kind of thing I don't think you can plan. Uh, but I, I started just taking pictures of her as she told her story. And what you will see in this are the expressions that are now captured in her, in her face, in her countenance, that correspond to what she's saying in her testimony. And it's all the more meaningful. It, the series is, uh, will not only enable you to know Sister Dawn, but it will give you a better look at the kind of feelings 
uh, that come through expressions that lay inside a person's heart. Um, So this section is about sickness and injury and pain. Um, It's a testimony, her personal testimony of what she went through when, when she was actually sustained in unbelievable anguish. And you'll see what I mean by that. This is Sister Dawn uh, as she was gathering her thoughts to tell me her, her story. Uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down a bulleted list of what happened to her in her life so that you can see how very real this idea of, of um, unbearable pain was for her. Her mother hated her from the womb. She said her birth, she told her, your birth ruined my life. When she was two, her mother tried to drown her. She left her, she took her out, pushed her under the water, and walked back up on the shore and left her out there. And her aunt saw her bobbing in the water. She was gasping for her breath. Her mother had taken a walk and she went and was saved by her aunt. At the age of six, her living uncle began to exploit her. When she was 13, she was abused by a taxi driver. She was on the street and pregnant at 17. She had the child. She never knew the child. She lost it. And and, and that memory of a lost child stayed with her until uh, we knew her all the way through her whole life. She married a man who tried to beat her second child to death in her womb. He was an abuser. Over the next decade, he broke 12 bones in her body. She said she kept, kept having to go to the hospital until one time in the latter part of this whole horrible decade, um, they looked at her and she she was always lying about why she had these injuries. She said she would fall and so on. Basically, he was beating on her. And they looked at her and they said, this didn't happen for the reason you're telling us, did it? And so they had sort of a little wake-up moment in all of that abuse. At 42, she left him, found her mother again, but she said when she went in to see her mother... She beat her to the ground. She said, I could have fought her, but she said, I I couldn't fight my mother. And so she just let her beat her to the ground. She met a powerful man, George, who became her protector. That's George. Nobody can mess with George. George was beaten by his mother and sister uh, during his early childhood. He left home at the age of six. He went to live with his grandfather. His grandfather turned him into a rum runner as soon as he could drive in Brownville, Texas, as somebody that runs alcohol illegally across the border. At 15, a gang attempted, because he was good at what he did, a gang attempted to enlist him to run drugs. When he refused, they set his house on fire while he was asleep in it. And he was burned in over 80% of his body from that fire. He spent a year in a hospital, seven months lying in an oil bath with his eyes sewn shut. He survived as a powerful man, but as a loner, instinctively, all the while, just in his own simplistic way, seeking God. He could hardly speak. He doesn't speak the English language very well. And um, I think his parents were an Indian and... and, uh, uh, a Mexican. Um, so his, his language is not very good. He had no education. I don't think, think he even went to school. Um, if he did, it was just in the very early years of his childhood. He and Don met 13 years ago when this was, uh, when I did this two years ago, so it would be 15 now, and uh, were married in 2012. They were baptized in 2014. Don had discovered the truth. She was taking lessons on the inter- internet with one of our members. And uh, we finally had to accelerate those lessons and we started seeing her and, and that led to his and her baptism in 2014. So there's another side to Dawn's life besides those, those sparse details of her story. Why does Sister Dawn hurt so bad? Because she couldn't really come to meeting after she was baptized. Um, she was way overweight. Um, Every time we went to see her, she was in pain, pretty serious pain, relentless pain. So this is the story of her physical condition. She was born with a genetic kidney disease called focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. 
um, very serious disease. Being bipolar, she was put on lithium, which induced neur neurogenic diabetes, um, insipidus, which is otherwise referred to as NDI, causing chronic hyperdehydration. These two conditions destroyed her kidneys over time, uh, converted them to scar tissue, and they were unable to function. We met her. She had, I think, 4% of her kidney function, which is not a pleasant way to live. In 2012, she was di diagnosed with end-stage renal failure, and, and that led to depression, but all the while she was learning the truth. And so there's this sharp contrast between this miserable life, which in every respect was um, met with one disaster after another, and her physical condition and all the pains of her body. And then she learns the truth. So I don't know about you. When I learned the truth, I was pretty happy. I was also kind of miserable. I was 17. I was miserable because I had become aware of the sin that dwelt the law of sin and death in my members. And uh, so on that side of it, but I hadn't gone through anything like this. I was raised in a happy family with two uh, wonderful parents who were both diligent and applied in the truth, had been raised in it from their youth. And, um, and, and, and so, so I, I don't think the truth means any more to her than it does to me. But there was something about Dawn when she described what happened to her, when she learned the truth and she met Christadelphians that just brought her to life while she was dying. You know, this is a paradox in that, a wonderful paradox. To avoid fatality, she was given two options, dialysis or transplant. So she had to wait and she had other conditions that, would, would, that delayed everything. She started uh, fistulas, um, which is a vein artery graft for dialysis, and they were very painful. She went on dialysis because her veins were too weak for the fistulas, and they put a catheter to her heart, and she would say something like, that was painful. So was dumb. Health issues resulted in debilitating weight gain over 300 pounds, preventing the transplant. There were sev seven catheter treatments, uh, which induced strokes from constant clotting. Can you imagine going through this while you're learning the truth? And... And it was pretty much that period in the, in the four years. Um, in 2016, without precedent or explanation for her, uh, her kidneys suddenly started functioning. And they, she was on her deathbed. She got baptized. And just inside two years, she was able to get off her dialysis and her kidneys started functioning. We, and she said, this is a miracle. It, 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 it must be that God is that close to me. And so all of her hope turned into a kind of a uh, an immediate deliverance from a condition she was sure was going to take her out. And yet, with her familial, if you call them that, her, the horrible conditions of her life around other people who, have, who, who used her and abused her, and the physical issues she had to deal with in all of her life, this is her testimony. She had makeup on to cover the, the black areas where her cheek was, was still bruised from those falls. Yeah, if we want to be partakers of Christ's body, we need to be partakers of his suffering. How does that comfort me? Well, I'm sharing Christ's suffering. If, if I'm sharing Christ's suffering, it's like a blessing. Christ, I, I you have feel to feel blessed. Yeah, but why do you feel that way if God, if, if you're suffering so much physically? 
So when you say a compromise word, what does that mean to you? you if I find a promise that I feel refers to me, that God has made it through, the, through his word, I take that promise, literally. And I believe it. Because if I don't, I'm saying, oh, I guess God lied about that one. Okay. I'm going to go, God, liar, how dare I? How dare anyone? I don't know if you recognize this, but that was an area of consideration that Dr. Thomas went through in Elpis Israel. It's calling God a liar if, if we don't believe his promises. She got that from Elpis Israel. So do you ever question God's justice because of, of this? You mean nature has done this to me, life has done this to me. God is the only hope I have of being healed. I never want to I never said why me. Do I ever say that? I never say one me. I say, thank God, it's me, and it didn't happen on my kids or someone else I love. I know God that will help me through it. When I can't get up, when I, when I really can't move my knees like in the morning, I say, I can do all things in him who strengthens me. And then I have to get up, because if I don't, then it will be And I will not. I refuse to pull out a liar, so I get it. And I walk. And that's, that's what God has for me. That's how God comforts me. And I'm here by His word. Because God's word will not come back void and empty. So I get up and I walk. But in all that extreme uh, discomfort, how did you find comfort? What was it? The hope of the kingdom. How did the hope of the kingdom give you God? This too shall pass. The pain shall pass. So she had several anchors that she had in place that she would lean on as she went through all these um, cyclical burdens she was carrying. And this was the one, I asked her, what's the one verse that really stands out to you as the most important uh, in terms of your comfort? And she said, for I know that my Redeemer, she went straight to Job, that my Redeemer lives and that he shall stand in the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. She had a poem that she said is her favorite poem. I'm going to read that to you now. It's called All I Hoped For. I don't know if you've ever heard this poem before, but knowing her story, you can see what she's saying here. I asked God for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might learn to humbly obey. I asked God for health that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked God for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked God for power, that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness, that I might feel the need of God. I asked for all things, that I might enjoy life. I got nothing that I asked for, but everything. I had hoped for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I am among all people most richly blessed. Last fall, Sister Dawn fell asleep in Christ. This was just a few days before she finally fell asleep. I said, Dawn, do you have a last message? I'll write it down and tell people. She said, yeah. She said, no matter what you feel, God is with you. Put yourself in your master's arms. God is real. Tim taught me the truth. And now I can live forever. What I love about her language is it's so childlike. It's, it sounds like the, the pure heart of a little child. And I think in many ways she had to, to survive. She had to bypass the, the weight of her, her aging and her adulthood and her infirmities and narrow down to whatever happiness she could see she could see life through uh, in the eyes of a little girl and now I can live forever 
Before she died, she wrote our Ecclesia, a letter, and this is of particular interest to us because of the things that stood out to her as being important in her connection to Christadelphians and to the Ecclesia. Those of us who, who maybe take the Ecclesia for, for granted or we've lived in it all our lives couldn't possibly come up with the sort of realizations that she had by suddenly in her life being connected to people who, for her, were the, the, the voice and the eyes and the hands of Jesus in her life. She felt his touch, she saw his face, and she heard his voice in the Ecclesia. This is what she said. She asked me to read this with the announcements one Sunday morning. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, this letter has been long and late in coming, but I can no longer remain quiet about the mercy and power of Yahweh or the rocks will indeed cry out. I've heard it said that either we see everything as a miracle or nothing as a miracle. I see miracles. Our lives themselves are a miracle to Yahweh's ability to sustain us to sustain us simultaneously. The continued presence of the Ecclesia on earth is a miracle. That the truth is still being preached and people are still answering the call is a miracle. She's so going, what was she getting at there? At this age of the earth, with the world at this level of ungodliness, and the truth is still being preached and people are still answering to her is a miracle. I've been up, down, and sometimes even sideways, but my faith in Yahweh, his ecclesia, and note this, the men he has given to lead and advise us, the men he has given to lead and advise us, and especially my hope in the kingdom has never wavered. So what would produce a focus on the men of the ecclesia that she had? And I can tell you what that was. She had known abusive men all her life, Men who, who saw her as an object, men who used her, men who mistreated her, broke her down. And um, when she met Christadelphians, she met men who were gentlemen, who had genuine love for people who were in trouble, who would take their time and give it to her, who when they spoke sounded like Jesus might be saying the same thing, who when they shared the bread and the wine with her, cried with her, she met men that to her seemed so much to be like Christ. We had a rota in our ecclesia, so brother after brother went to see her and George where they lived on certain Sundays. So she said, that never wavered. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Why did she say that? She said that because since its inception, the Norfolk Ecclesia has had a banner up front that said that. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. It's up on our podium now in gold letters. And she saw that in the few times that she was able to come to meeting with us. So that stood out to her as something that the Ecclesia is about. But, but when she said, one hope, one faith, one baptism, was there not, was that not full and rich with substance and meaning? The kind of substance you and I both know is embodied in those words but maybe seldom think about in the way that she's using them here. Then she says, God's word stand on, stands on its own and you have had the blessing to have found it. So cherish the truth and cherish the ecclesia. I wish I was there among you. In my heart I am. Keep the one hope clearly in your sight. Our Lord's return is imminent. May we all be found worthy to enter in. Come Lord Jesus, Sister Dawn Uzak. So that was the end of her story. She's now asleep in Christ. She has no pain, for he gives his beloved sleep. There's no feeling in it, but it's not unlike bliss. It's a blissful state because it's weightless, it's painless. It has no knowledge of the sufferings of the world or depress personal depression to be associated with. She's just sleeping, waiting to wake up for he gives his beloved sleep. As I said, the story doesn't end there because there is recovery in the kingdom and all that would be meaningless without the substance of what we understand lies before us in the kingdom of God. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. The ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. 
Then the lame shall leap like a deer or like a heart. This is a picture of a heart. It's a young deer. And the tongue of the dumb shall sing. There's something so amazing to me about this picture because that, that heart, you know, I, I'd love to see an animation, a, a movie of it, but that heart seems to be weightless, not bound to gravity, full of strength and energy. And it's just captured perfectly in this picture. Speaking of Israel, for thus said the Lord, says the Lord, behold, I will extend peace to her like a river and the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. Then you shall suck. You shall be born upon her sides and be dandled upon her knees. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. So the whole concept of the city of peace and the city of the great king and the throne of David and the return of, of Christ to establish that throne and this throng of people who once suffered standing around him in praise and honor and power and glory to his name, this, this picture of comfort in Jerusalem is full in our hearts. There's almost no detail left out because God has already revealed, revealed through the mouths of his servants, the prophets, what he intends to do in that day when he comes and is with us and he saves us. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem right now. It's just what we know. It comes in the form of knowledge. This particular passage means a lot to me because when I was 17, I was having my own little trial of adolescence and I found peace in baptism and I found peace in this passage which I converted to a song that uh, my sister wife sang with me for years in our youth. Um, we sang this together. Oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul like a child quieted at its mother's breast. Like a child quieted is my soul. What a beautiful picture of the future that is. And when you see this, when you see it with your eyes, your heart will rejoice and your bones will flourish like an herb. Fifty years before the, the time uh, of, of her time with us, when I was in college, my mother had a way of sitting with her hands folded uh, one over another in, in her lap. And her hands were the hands of service all my life. Everyone that knew my mother knew that those hands symbolized service. And uh, so I said, Mom, can I, can I just draw your hands? I really just want to capture that that gesture that I think is so beautiful in your hands. So she sat down. She had her, her, her robe on and um, let me draw her hands. And that was when I was, um, when she was 44 years old, I was in college. Then when she was 94, 50 years later, fast forward, and she was dying, um, she was sitting in her chair and she had her little arm, alarm watch on. And uh, I looked at her hands and I saw what I had drawn so many years earlier but now in a state of having borne all the weight of mortality throughout her life. And uh, I took a picture of them to relate the two, which I'm now doing and I have the pleasure of doing in this series. Uh, means a little bit more to me than perhaps it would to you, but think of all that and everything we've thought of in this verse. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Think of what Dawn would think if she read that, how that would enable her to manage her discomfort with strength and what a comfort it would be to her. Say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong and do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God, and he will come and save you. And he healed them as an earnest when he was here. He couldn't save the world then. I know he wanted to. I, I think that was the nature of his prayer in Gethsemane when he said, let this cup pass from me Somehow or another, that must have meant if we can just bring in peace and salvation and the blessing of the nations now, isn't it enough? Has the suffering of the world gone on long enough now for us to do it now? Nevertheless, possibly with that thought, he says, not my will, but thine be done. So his fame spread throughout all Syria because he wanted to do what little he could do in that day. And they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them, every one of them. 
When the sun was setting, all those who had any who had were sick and were vari- with various diseases brought them to him and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And healed them all. When I was a teenager and I would run across this in the readings, um, wherever it appeared in the gospel, and many followed him and he healed them all. For some reason, it made me cry every time I read it. Um, still does actually because the concept of God sending his son to the earth finally, finally in that day of his appearing, that wonderful day when God rains down righteousness and peace on this earth and he heals all of the people in the world and you and I will see it with our eyes and we'll be there with our hands to touch them and heal them like he did. There's so much in that that he healed them all. So in the resurrection, what we hope for, what Dawn hopes for now, we're raised in incorruption. That means unending existence. That's the specific meaning of the word incorruption in that passage. Our existence will never end because we'll now have the righteousness of God driving our character and matched with perfect bodily health and unending existence, immortality. We'll be sown in dishonor, but raised in honor with, with, and praise. And what, what we know is that when we're assembled around the throne as seven spirits of fire, giving all the praise to Christ, who's now enthroned and his, his, his mission has been fulfilled with respect to this marriage to his bride, what we get from him, he puts us like a crown on his head. He says, you're the jewels in my crown. In that day when I make up my jewels, you are my jewels, God said in Malachi. And we are praising him and he gives us the praise of a groom for his bride. It was all throughout the song, isn't it? The song of Solomon. So we're sown in weakness, but raised in power. And that power means miraculous abilities. And miraculous abilities for us means that the comfort that we now understand in full from the tribulation we suffered in our mortal lives, we can bring to the nations, not just to the ecclesia, not to those one or two people around us who need our help, but to the nations, to the starving millions in Africa, to the the, the pathetic abused in families where there were selfish fathers and ignorant mothers, to all the people of the world who who in war-torn countries, impoverished and starving, and full of anxiety and stress and perplexity of nations, And our miraculous abilities will be there multiplying the hands and and garments of Christ by thousands upon thousands throughout the world to heal it from its miseries. Sown a natural body but raised a spiritual body and this may be the best of all on a personal level. No longer with the weight of sin and death in our members. And all of us know what that weight is. Not even able to be tempted anymore. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And once again, I'm saying, you know, we, we read this a lot, but now in, in this focus, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall be, there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away.